thanks a lot for joining in on our uh, monthly speaker series. For those who are um, new, we run a speaker series from uh, September through May, the third Wednesday of every month. Uh, we talk on a variety of different topics related to natural history. If you're a real birding fan, we also have a bird study group, which meets the first Wednesday of every month, again from September through to May. Our May uh, speaker, or, or sorry, our May bird study group will be coming up on um, on May the third, and we'll be going to New Zealand virtually to learn about birding in New Zealand. So that should be a really good program. Um, but before we turn it over to Kaya and Matt, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, we are living and working and playing, I guess, within the, uh, the Treaty 7 lands of the First Nations who signed the treaty, which would include the Blackfoot Confederacy, and that would comprise of the Saksika, the Gainai, and the Pekani First Nations. Also, just on our doorstep, we have the Satina First Nation as well, and out to the west is the Stony Nakoda, which is comprised of the Wesley, Chiniki, and Good Stony uh, First Nations. We are also part of uh, Region 3 of the Métis uh, Nation, and so we acknowledge and thank them for their stewardship in the past and going forward for protecting our natural heritage that we have here locally. So uh, thank you for that. And I would um, now turn it over to Kaya. I think actually Matt's going to go first. Oh, and I'd, yeah, <laughs> Matt, Matt, with, Matt uh, and Kaya. Uh, oh. I'd like to actually say, sorry, Kaya. Um, Matt and Kai are, are both uh, on the board for, for Nature Calgary and provide a great service to the club. So I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that right off the top. And we're lucky to have them tonight to explain an exciting thing coming up, which is the Nature Challenge. So uh, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Don, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Okay, so I received one message in the chat wondering, is this truly an intro to iNaturalist? And I would say, no, it won't be tonight. I've done several of these presentations for Nature Calgary and other groups to promote the City Nature Challenge over the past five years. So tonight I'm gonna actually provide a few kind of stats where we're at with iNaturalist information in terms of the City of Calgary. And I want to show you what all of your observations over the past five years have amounted to. So there will be a bit of a tutorial. Um, I'll do a live kind of desktop upload, which should be only about maybe five minutes long. And then Kaya at the end will drop into a how to submit your observations through the app. So yeah, as I mentioned, this is the fifth annual Calgary City Nature Challenge. I'm really excited about it. Like when I first started this, I could not have imagined that we'd keep this going and it wouldn't be possible without the support of Nature Calgary. So we'll jump right into it here. So since year one in 2019, these are kind of the pillars that I would say that I started the City Nature Challenge in Calgary and why I continue to do it. The primary reason is to connect people with nature. I love our park systems. I consider them to be our museums within Alberta as a whole, and they need to be celebrated as much as they can. So if I can get people to visit them, if I can encourage people to engage with different types of biodiversity, then to me, the City Nature Challenge is a success of itself. The second part is, you know, through my background in uh, geography and urban ecology, I realized that there was just a lot that we didn't know about uh, our urban ecosystem. So citizen science, I have realized that that is one of the most important things that we can do as people to contribute data to the people who are making decisions regarding our, the places that we love. Um, you know, in terms of community, each year we try and work with as many different conservation groups and park stewardship groups as we can and encourage people of all different walks of life to look up, join and support their local groups. So that's always been huge. And, in terms of promoting conservation, all of the above kind of fit into it, uh, filling in the data gaps, working with uh, the stewards who really strive and do a lot of work throughout the year 
uh, to protect our natural places. And further fostering that relationship with, with nature helps to do all of that. One part that I wouldn't say is so much local, but more of a global collaboration is just advancing our understanding of urban ecosystems. And the City Nature Challenge is a great opportunity to do that, working with partners all over the world. And we'll kind of talk about that here. So these are all the cities participating this year. And there are 462, maybe 63 cities around the world that are involved. Um, this has grown exponentially each year. So in 2019, Calgary was one of the first three Canadian cities to be involved. And this year we have 43 Canadian cities. And we're actually missing one pin way up in the north there um, on this map. But yeah, so we have 43 Canadian cities. And you can see that, you know, originally this was predominantly in the US, but it has expanded to all continents. And even at one point, we had the uh, research center on in Antarctica participate. So it changes a bit each year, but uh, the engagement in terms of people, the number of observations, and how long is this? The, the, um, the interest in just urban biodiversity is uh, just a key right now for two reasons. One, you know, I think we all recognize that there's kind of a biodiversity crisis right now, a collapse, you might say. Uh, in part due to climate change, but also, you know, urban development puts a lot of stress on local biodiversity. So uh, events like this help to not only document things, but it kind of sparks the interest throughout the year to get people really involved and activate them to become better stewards of the environment. So, you know, in terms of what this global city nature challenge looks like, there are probably a thousand organizers from all over the world. We've been meeting virtually online since last September and we do monthly meetings. And now I think just the City Nature Challenge logo alone has been translated into 60 different languages. So I took all of them and copy and pasted them into here and that's kind of what it looks like, but really cool to see how um, just the term city nature challenge can be described in so many different ways and languages. So the name of the game with the city nature challenge is that at once, at one point it was a competition and now we kind of perceive it more as a collaboration. Cities are aiming to make the most observations, document the most species and engage the most people. And in Calgary, since 2019, I've had the goal that we could achieve 10,000 observations. And we haven't quite done it, but I'm hoping that this is the year. And with your help, I think we can. So the event this year will take place April 28th to May 1st. And we want you to head out into your yards, neighborhoods, and favorite parks and document any type of biodiversity. This is, could be, you know, plants, animals, fungi, even microorganisms, and of course, our aquatic friends, the fish, if you can get out there. So how do you do that? You take photos of these things, or if you can't get a photo, you can do an audio recording directly out of the iNaturalist app. And with that, we're gonna have you upload your observations to iNaturalist, and that's how we compare all the cities across the world. So the Calgary metropolitan region, it's a bit of a subject or subjective area, but I've defined it more or less as Rocky View County, the city of Calgary and Foothills County. And it includes all of the municipalities within that. And the first year in 2019 with the City Nature Challenge, we only had the city of Calgary involved. I then kind of added a few more in, such as Airdrie, Cochrane, Glenbow Ranch, Chestermere, and Okotoks. But there was a lot of gaps within that area. 
And I thought it would be better to expand this, not only to fill in those gaps, but perhaps for a much longer, you know, prediction of what could happen. So for example, uh, urban sprawl, there could definitely be changes within the Calgary municipal boundary or Airdrie or any of those other cities. So why not just make it more of an all encompassing space for people to make their observations. So April 28th to May 1st, this is your area to target. You can go wherever you want and hit as many places as, as you like, but we want you to submit your observations from within this area, which will be automatically included within Calgary's entry. As for obscured observations, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit later on, but um, these are also automatically included if they were originally observed within this area. So I'll expand a bit on that later on. So one of the things with this presentation tonight is I really want to encourage you to participate. And every single year, I always get a little bit of pushback about why I should participate in the City Nature Challenge. I've heard every reason you could imagine. So I wanted to kind of debunk that a little bit here. So some of the primary reasons are to, you know, educate others, including our local community about biodiversity. Every single observation that you share is open source. It's accessible to people. When you take a photo of a mallard or a golden eye or Canada goose, I can see the location of that observation and I can go further into iNaturalist to learn a bit more about those things. One is that, you know, I know nowhere to kind of go and explore things. And this can be really valuable, especially in terms of kind of, you know, ecotourism, but it can also support other things such as fill in data gaps. And these could be perceived as, you know, researchers or scientists that are trying to understand a place or perhaps even a season. In terms of seasons, we refer to this as phenology. You could picture that as something like migration patterns or the blooming of a certain flower at a certain time of year, or perhaps even, uh, you know, the emergence of say butterflies or other types of insects. Besides our community, there's a lot of different people that are using iNaturalist data to support their efforts. And I'll kind of speak to the Weaselhead project in a moment here, but the information that you provide to iNaturalist is highly valuable. So there's over 3,000 papers now, like scientific peer-reviewed journals that are, have referenced iNaturalist data. One of the main things is COSIWIC which assesses kind of the status of species across the entire taxonomic spectrum. And probably about, you know, depending on the subject matter, maybe five to 40% of all of the data that they're using for their understanding to assess a status is coming from, you know, citizen science apps like iNaturalist. You know, eBird's another one that's obviously huge, um, but we also have local conservation groups such as Weasel had doing this. Uh, one other major thing is that I do feel that iNaturalist data can help leverage and inform the actions that are taken by land managers, consultants, and government. And I'll kind of draw more into that in a minute here. So we have this iNaturalist uh, project through the Weaselhead Preservation Society. And this is a geographic area, including North Glenmore Park, South Glenmore Park, the reservoir, and the Weaselhead Natural Area. So to date, there's over 10,200 observations there. And these have been submitted by 500 observers that have used iNaturalist. We know that you know so many people visit the park and people are always taking photos of things they see, particularly the cliff swallows, which you know under, under the bridge there. 
but um, they often don't know that they can share observations to iNaturalist. And this is something that I personally manage, but also oversee almost on a daily basis, I review this project. And if you're wondering why I bring this one up, it's because the Weaselhead is by far the, the most biodiverse area that we have within the city limits. The you know, Fish Creek Park is not far behind, but it comes down to the types of habitat, the quality of the habitat, and the, also the impact that people have on the space. So much of the Weaselhead is you know, inaccessible, uh, but that's one of the reasons why it makes it such a gem. So below here, you can see a couple of recent observations. And I point these out because it's interesting to see, like, how are people engaging with nature? You know, I don't necessarily agree with people feeding uh, birds or wildlife within our parks, but if that makes them care more about a place, then I think there's a larger discussion to be had there, and we can also, you know, learn from these types of observations. So. So this is the uh, Weaselhead project area. And a couple of things I wanna point out here. Uh, so one, the reservoir, you can see all those blue dots. Those are almost all birds. And you can see that most people are taking photos from the shore. So the birds are often not in the center of the reservoir. Um, if you look closer to the Weaselhead Flats area, you can actually make out the trails where people are walking. People are most often taking photos right off the trail. And we find a lot more plant observations in the weasel head. So just a couple little things there. All right, so I wanted to share this because I know a lot of people wonder like, how are our local iNaturalist observations being used? And in 2021, the city of Calgary commissioned an ecological inventory of five different parks. And this one, this is just a couple snapshots from that report within Weaselhead. And I want you to pay attention just to the source of where these potential species could be found within the Weaselhead. Uh, you'll probably notice that there's a couple sources here that are absent. And the main one is probably eBird. So this is done by a professional consulting company uh, to do this report. And I can't help but notice how interesting, how interesting it is that, you know, probably 80 to 90% of all of the observations included this do have reference to iNaturalist. There are other sources. So these are, um, you know, plant databases or, uh, wildlife management system to the government of Alberta. But these observations that you're sharing within any park, any place, I just want you to realize that these are demonstrated within professional reports by consultants for you know, trying to understand a bit of an area. One of the reasons why these are used in these types of reports now is because when conducting an ecological inventory or perhaps even a bird survey, you know, the consultants or the field wildlife biologists, they just can't be there at all times of the year. So they are looking to open source data like citizen science information from eBird and iNaturalist to understand what's happening throughout the year so that they can make informed decisions about what should happen down the line. In terms of the city of Calgary as a whole, We're sitting at about 128,000 observations as of today. And these are only um, wild observations. It doesn't include the captive or cultivated ones, which would be you know, street trees, plants in your garden, uh, pets, animals at the zoo. It has, this doesn't include any of that. So as a whole, you can see we have over 3,200 species that have been documented within the city of Calgary, and that's amazing. So we're up to just over 4,500 observers that have used iNaturalist. And I also just wanna point out that this is only the city of Calgary municipal boundaries. 
all of these circles that you see outside are observations that have been made within our boundaries, but they are obscured. So they may be close to the edge or something like that, but because of the obscuring of the observation, the random point is placed outside the circle. So I've got a little snapshot of our events at the end of this presentation, but this was a really great one last year, exploring at Clembo Ranch with some of the stewards there. So I want to dive a bit more into the stats from iNaturalist. And once again, these are all from the municipal boundaries of the city of Calgary. Uh, I was only able to collect all of the data from up to March 20th. So it's about a month old now, but um, I think the trends are still fairly evident. So, you know, in 2019, um, we were sitting at about, you know, 8,000 observations. And during the City Nature Challenge, we made 3,000 alone. So these little dark lines here, you can kind of see the spikes that happened during the City Nature Challenge. But in my opinion, the biggest and most interesting thing is the follow through. So kind of the, the backswing on this. So each year with the City Nature Challenge, we get a spike and that's from the participation during that event. But throughout April into um, usually about the end of September, we just get observations consistently throughout the year. And you can see that each year, that little spike where CNC is, it's a little bit more, but also that curve gets a bit steeper. So if you're wondering about those plateaus, you know, that's winter time, it's cold in Calgary and not that many people are making observations at that time. So it gets quite a bit slower at that time. Uh, in terms of our cumulative species. So yeah, we're almost at 5,000 species across the entire city. And a lot of these spikes do happen at the city, the city nature challenge but you can see that there is a tremendous increase of the number of species that are documented within the municipality each year. Slowly, this is kind of tapering off, if you notice at the top here, and that's because it gets harder and harder to add a new species to the list because they become either so well documented or they are just so rare. Uh, it might be a little bit hard to see, but there's a couple of little gaps in the line here. And that's actually when, spe when we haven't observed any new species. So this graph is on a, it's on a weekly basis is how we map this out. So there might be a few weeks during the year that we actually don't get any new species. In terms of users though, I'll show you one other graph after this, but you can see it took a long time to get up to kind of that thousand mark for new users. And I gotta say that iNaturalist was kind of in its early days at that time, especially within Canada. And a lot of people just didn't know about it. So each year with the City Nature Challenge, we're getting more and more people involved. There's also groups like the University of Calgary, student classes that now have iNaturalist engagement components for marks and that really increases the amount of users we have every year. So in general, you know, these could be tourists passing through or something like that, but these are unique um, iNaturalist users that are kind of showing up over time within the city of Calgary. So this is kind of what a, um, all of our iNat data looks like by week and it's not a cumulative compared to the previous graphs, but yeah, you can see that there was like a huge spike in 2019, primarily due to um, CNC. And although I have the text going down here, it's actually not much of a decrease in people. In fact, we're getting more people each year. We're averaging about 40 to 50 people every single week of kind of the April to um, end of August time of year or so. In the winter, we might get a few people and that's where you see the troughs here. But overall, I would say that the, the growth of iNaturalist continues to surge and 
lots of people are still joining up. Uh, this is what I was kind of mentioning with the new species. So we are still getting a lot of new species, probably, you know, maybe a few hundred every year or so, maybe more. But you can see that the number of new species is actually kind of going down each year. And as I mentioned, it's because they become harder to find or harder to document. They've, they were already previously documented. But almost consistently throughout the summer, we see new species being added to our city list. Um, and then for this graph here, the thing I want you to notice is not so much the CNC, but actually afterwards. So in 2019, we may have had about maybe 400 observations happening every single week, probably less than that. But we're averaging almost 1,000 observations per week since 2021. And that's, again, April to September. But those are huge contributions to what we can understand within the city. So maybe I'll just take a quick look at the chat here. Looks like we got a few questions, but so no questions just yet, but feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll address them as we go along. Um, so each year, as I said, I get all these different questions about, you know, what's What's the point of iNaturalist? How is this any good? Uh, why should I participate either in the CNC or throughout the year? So I kind of put together probably I don't know, two or three iNat facts. And I want to address this one to a lot of kind of nature photographers. So there's always been a lot of concern about copyrights, uh, the resharing of images, that type of thing. And I want to let you know that within iNaturalist, you can control that much better than you can on any social media app. Specifically kind of looking at like Facebook, Instagram, or other platforms like that. And it's all about kind of managing your copyright. So I'll just kind of show you how this works exactly. This is a screenshot of what it looks like on your homepage within iNaturalist. And if you go up to the top right corner, you can click on your profile. You're going to want to go to this content and display. And underneath, you'll find licensing. And when you click on that, you can set a default license, or you can also do this for individual observations, but you can set the type of licensing that you want for your observation. And what this means is that when you share your photos to iNaturalist, you can still support you know, citizen science, conservation, promoting uh, information or education within biodiversity while still protecting your photos. So I think a lot of people overlook this and it's sometimes a barrier for them wanting to contribute to iNaturalist, but I wanna let you know that you can protect your information here. The other question that I seem to get a lot is, you know, how can I not share the location of sensitive animals? This particularly comes down to a lot of ethical questions regarding photographing wild animals. Um, I'm sure that you've all seen things about, you know, ethical wildlife tours, uh, not feeding wildlife, and not revealing their location. And how you can do that is two ways. So these both apply to the City Nature Challenge, but I want to make a case for this all the time kind of thing. So. The one is that, you know, don't post it immediately to social media or the apps when you find something remarkable. When you do that, it creates, you know, a bit of a stir and there's a lot of people who think they still have an opportunity to go see it and they want to try and, you know, capitalize on their own photographic skills and um, for other reasons as well, which we won't get into. But And then within iNaturalist, you can also obscure the location. And I'll give you kind of two reasons why you might want to do this, not just for the sake of the animal, but perhaps your own personal privacy. So I think a lot of you 
if not everyone have probably heard about that remarkable sighting of a wolverine that was in the city of Calgary the other day. Uh, it's not on iNaturalist, but I would love it to be. And I just am using this wolverine observation as an example for kind of what obscuring an observation looks like. So you can see here, we've got this fantastic photo of a wolverine walking through this meadow here. And if we look kind of to when it was observed, you can see it only says July 2021 and when it was submitted. The key thing here is this little kind of eyeball that's showing. It shows on the date as well as on the map. And then it also says obscured here. And what obscured means is that you have a 20 by 20 kilometer uh, cell where the location of that organism is randomly placed. So when I look at this map, this is what it looks like for me. And when you look at this map, that point is going to actually be in like a different location. And that's how you protect you know, the location of an organism without it being like mobbed by the paparazzi. So don't feel like if you share something that you're giving up a um, you're like sacrificing this animal or its location or its its personal wildness. There are ways to protect these things, and this is something that everyone needs to recognize that can be done. Uh, one thing I'll mention about obscuring information is that for any sensitive species that's considered, um, not necessarily every sensitive species, but species that are at risk or endangered have their own status. And these are automatically obscured. So for example, if you look for any photos of grizzly bears or wolverines for that matter, this automatically happens regardless of what the photographer has posted themselves. Uh, one of the reason you might obscure your observation is because you wanna protect your own personal privacy. Perhaps you don't want people to know where you're going. Perhaps you're making photos in your yard or maybe even in your house because there's a bug crawling around. Uh, those are opportunities for you to obscure your data while protecting your own personal privacy doing that. So how you do that, um, I think Kaya will demonstrate how to do it in the app, but this is kind of the iNaturalist uploader. And I've just pulled this sharp tail grouse photo in here. I didn't add any coordinates to it for uh, the reason that we're um, recording this observation. Uh, this is on a historical lec, so I want to protect it that much. But all you have to do is go to the side panel here with the orange box, and you can change that location from public to obscured. And that's it. And if you're uploading, say, 100 observations or five or however many, all you need to do is highlight all. You can do the select all, and you can click obscured, and you've automatically you know, protected the locations of all of those. So at this point, I want to just drop into a really quick iNaturalist sample upload on the desktop before I pass it off to Kaya. I'll just check in to see um, if there's any questions here, but yeah, Matt, we've got two questions. The first is, uh, if we upload audio, um, <clears throat> will iNAT recognize the audio and actually be, give, be able to give uh, an ID on that one? So currently, um, iNaturalist doesn't have an audio identifier, but it could be something that comes down the line. There's two things you can do. One is that you can use apps like Merlin, make an audio recording where it will tell you what species were recorded. You can download that um, audio recording and upload it directly into iNaturalist. You will have to modify the date and the time that it was recorded, but at least you'll know what species to enter. The other thing is that you can just upload, make an audio recording directly from the app and put a tentative placeholder name. So let's say you see a bird and you make an audio recording, just type in the name birds and let the community of iNaturalist users come back and identify it for you. So those are kind of the two ways to do it, I would say. 
Um, you can also record other things like, for example, amphibians, frogs. They're very difficult to photograph, so it's a good opportunity to use audio recordings for those. And you may, for example, hear coyotes or maybe even owls or something if you're doing nocturnal surveys, and those can also be recorded. So was there another question there, Kai? Yeah, the second one is, uh, is it worth submitting observations of common and previously observed species? So things that like our magpies, chickadees, coyotes, things that we see very often, or even trees. Yes, I would say so, because there's a couple of reasons for it. <clears throat> As I always kind of mention with iNaturalist, it's not always about biodiversity. It's about, you know, participation. There's a lot of kind of social information that can be gathered from iNaturalist that I think can definitely benefit the world. One of the main things is that when you share an observation, you could see that as you know the subject within your photos, but it could also be interpreted as you connecting with nature in you know a meaningful way. And trust me, I get that there are other meaningful ways to connect with nature, but this is one simple way that you can kind of do that and provide information for people doing that kind of research. Um, <clears throat> There are no shortage of mallard observations. In fact, it's like the most observed species on the planet. And of course, because it's ubiquitous. But each one of those kind of observations shared uh, does help us learn a little bit more about mallards. So it could be something to do with their behavior, the distribution, also looking at things kind of like migration, um, you know, even kind of the, the phenotypes, the colors. Uh, the sex, all that stuff. People are looking at this types of information. So I would definitely encourage you during the City Nature Challenge and throughout the year to make observations of anything that is interesting to you and you feel that is worth sharing. All right, so I'm gonna try and do a live upload for iNaturalist here. And I'm just going to stop sharing for one second. Okay, so if you've never used the iNaturalist website, uh, here in Canada, I would encourage you to use iNaturalist.ca. This way, when your observations are posted, uh, Canadian data managers such as NatureServe Canada, they kind of have the first access to it. And these are really important sites in terms of research, um, in terms of getting access to Canadian data. If you share to iNaturalist.org, it will eventually end up there, but there's a bit of a, a lag as it has to be processed through so many different servers. So when you get on to iNaturalist, there's a couple of pages you might wanna check out. One is the explore page where you can search to your heart's content for anywhere in the world, uh, look for different species, that kind of thing. Up here under your observations, those are things that you posted. And what I want to draw your attention to right now is kind of this upload button. And I'll show you how to upload some observations super quick. So it brings up the iNaturalist uploader. What I usually do is taking photos with my camera. I'll pull them into a folder off my SD drive. I may edit them. I might just um, keep them there for safekeeping, whatever. And I just drag those observations directly into the iNaturalist uploader. So I'll show you what these look like here. Uh, this was for my walk the other day at Beaver Dam Flats. And I saw two Townsend solitaire that were kind of dancing around in the trees, which is pretty nice. Took one photo of some grass. And you're probably like, oh yeah, we got grass everywhere, but not that exciting. But I want to show you a bit with that. And then there was also this hooded merganser in the pond. So the first thing you want to do when you get into iNaturalist is you want to deal with your locations. So 
when you click on location here, you can go right up to the top and you can pretty much type in any park. This is using um, Google Maps to kind of uh, search here. And if I type in Beaver Dam Flats, like it'll zoom right in on there. Uh, so it comes up with kind of this stock circle based on how much you're zooming. You can adjust the size of this, no problem. You can specify it down here. So it's at 126 meters, but I'll just go like 25. And if you grab this center button here, you can move it to where the bird was. So I saw it kind of right as I walked across this path, I had one there. And as you can see here, there's also a geo privacy tag. So you can view your open, obscured, or private. I don't recommend private. It's just a personal collection. Your images are not searchable. They're not available to any research or scientists around. So you can uh, pin this location if it's something you want to use like a lot. Say you go to Beaver Dam Flats like all the time. Maybe you want your circle like this. And you could pin this and name it Beaver Dam Flats. And that way you can just go to your pin locations and choose your, your location button. So we're going to put that one there. And when I click this one, you'll see it zooms into that location. So this guy was actually in this tree over here. And I'll just set the accuracy for 10 meters on that thing. But one of the issues that I'll just show you is that this grass here is actually like kind of on the other side of the park. It was up here. So if you're uploading a lot of observations from a huge area, say you went to Fish Creek Park and then you went up to Nose Hill Park, you want to upload those observations separately. So just do like Fish Creek at one place and then Nose Hill at another place. Otherwise, each time you try and geotag your photos, you're going to be bouncing between these two things. Uh, and then we had the hooded merganser, which I took from up on that hill, and he was swimming right down there. So that's pretty much all you need. You can see that the date time is all auto-populated based on the photo information. If you geotag your photos using GPS or anything like that, it's all recorded in the location. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this live uh, presentation tonight is just to show you like how quick this is. So when you click on species name, you can see that like the photos maybe not that great. It's so far away, but you can see within just a couple, uh, there's information provided. So visually similar and seen nearby means that the image recognition recognizes the bird or the subject. And it's also those types of observations have been seen near nearby. So within kind of, um, let's say Southern Alberta or the city of Calgary, that kind of thing. If you're not sure, <clears throat> there's a lot to learn on INAT. You can click the view button and it will bring you to so much information about these guys, including the status of your species, if you're really curious about those. So we're just gonna go Townsend Solitaire, you can see this is a bit better of a photo, so it's the first one suggested. Uh, the reason I'm using this grass is because I actually want to show you that it's even pretty good at grass. So, you know, I'm not a grass expert, but I know that this is smooth brome, which is an invasive grass we see in almost all of our parks, and it auto populates it. And then this uh, hooded merganser is pretty far away, and it's really dark in my photo, but you can see it's like the first thing that comes up. So it's super accurate. Uh, it gets better the more observations we have, and um, you know it's only going to get kind of better with time. During the City Nature Challenge, I want to recommend that if you see different individuals, to upload them as individual observations. But if you see like a group of like a hundred mallards, don't upload a hundred photos of mallards. What you can do is, you know, you can combine those photos just by dragging them over top of one another. And now you can see here, I have two photos of the pair of counts and solitaires that were hanging out. So uh, that's a good trick as well. If you're looking at plants, you want to take photos, you know, leaves, flowers, stem, any buds you might see, that kind of thing. So you might need to add a few more photos so that it can be identified. And your last step, all you really have to do is hit submit. 
And that's how you can upload a lot of observations. So definitely would encourage you to make as many as you can. And um, <clears throat> there's a couple other things that I'd encourage you to explore in here, but otherwise I feel like it's pretty straightforward. So kind of moving on, I wanted to share, we've got like a ton of events this year with the City Nature Challenge. So we have, I think 18 events as a whole, including tonight, but there is something for everyone. So we've got things like fish, we've got plant walks, we've got bird tours, including also the, um, where is it? On the Glenbow Ranch, it's a golf cart photography tour, which would be really fun. Uh, we're doing fungi mosses, pond dipping. Uh, we're doing a pollinator walk with some of the students from the University of Calgary. And this would not be possible without all of the partners that we have this year. So just want to give a shout out to them. And if you're interested in some of the public events that we have going on this year, I will share the link in the chat for you to check out. And if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer a couple. Otherwise, I'll pass it over to Kaya so she can help out with the iNaturalist app data. Uh, uploads that is so. Yeah, great. So it's already posted in the chat there. And just go to the events tab if you'd like to see those. Thanks so much, Matt. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to actually use the iNaturalist app. Um, but I just want to start a little bit about what we're going to be doing. So the first, as Matt has kind of said, the, the basis of all this is observations. And so I'm going to go through exactly what those observations are. I'm going to talk a little bit about using the app and then the ways to kind of give back to the community. Because as Matt emphasized, this is about building a community of people who care about nature and want to protect it. So that's why that's that social aspect, that sort of giving back aspect is so important. So what is an observation? <clears throat> it's a, an encounter with a single individual organism at a particular time, at a particular location. So it could be that you're observing that same organism over and over and over again at, that, at a particular time, but that can be important because it can show how long an organism is living in that or that it's using that space over time. Uh, so that question that we had earlier, you know, should I only be taking pictures of new things or no, you can actually take the same picture of the same organism over and over because you can show um, how, how it's sort of living its life over time. So I think that's also really important to understand. So in this case, it's really easy to sort of identify the observations. You know, we've got the muskrat here. This is a coral tooth fungus. Um, and then this one actually has two. So you can actually, when you go into the app, you can actually observe, have two observations with this. One, we're looking at, of course, a bee as well, or a pollinator. And then we also have um, a flower. So those two observations, um, so it's like a twofer. Sometimes uh, I naturalist, uh, sort of as they have a two for Tuesday and they have two observations together. And, and that, that these types of interactions are really important. The pollinator people especially love them because they really want to know where the pollinators are going, what plants they're using, when they're using them, um, how often they're using them, that kind of thing. So these types of interactions are critical for them. So actually um, being able to to identify the flower, not just the pollinator, is actually really good. So putting in uh, two, two observations um, showing that. But iNaturalist allows you to also look for signs of animals, because as we know, we don't always encounter the animals that we want to see. So you can put in a lots of different kinds of observations. So things like scat. Um, we found this bone. Um, it was actually of a, of a deer. Um, this is its sort of pelvis. Um, down in Fish Creek Park. Um, this is a, a footprint, I believe, of uh, um, a bobcat or a lynx. Um, so it's a, one of the cats. And then this is a sign of a beaver. So these are all important things. Um, and so it, Biologists always use these as bioindicators, and that's exactly what you could put in INAT. So it doesn't have to be the thing that, you know, is making it. It can be the thing that it made. So it could be a kill site, um, that kind of stuff. But the other thing you can also put in 
or sounds. I always use this one because it's my favorite sound. <laughs> and this is the Wilson snipe. Um, birds are really good at making sounds. Merlin has an excellent way of recording them and actually identifying them. So you can record and identify in there and then upload to iNaturalist, which is it's pretty easy from your phone. Um, but those sound recordings are very good. And people who are, especially people like me who are uh, birders who love listening, um, will go in and will identify through that. But as Matt said earlier, uh, things like amphibians, so uh, frogs are frogs, boreal chorus frogs, um, those types of things, they make a lot of noise, but you know, you you don't really see them. They, they take a long time to try and find. So if you can record sounds of them, you can get more observations, but you know they're there because they're making those sounds. So sounds are actually very critical. So don't, don't discount them when you're making observations. The next thing when you're taking pictures, make sure there is a focus in your picture. So this one up here, super lovely picture, really beautiful. I don't know what you're looking at. What do you want me to say? Um, do you want me to talk about the lily pads here? Do you want me to talk about the grasses? They're all so far away. I have no idea what you're 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 wanting me to identify. Sometimes you can put in a picture like that as a generality, like this was the habitat or this was the you know the place where it was. But make sure you include more detailed photos. Like this is really what the observation is about. Like this is a cattail. I want you to talk talk to me about this and this is the observation so really make that clear so plants are a great example of this because they stop they don't move like I know sometimes it's really difficult with birds or deer or things they just like zip in and out and you just get that one shot and that is all you have is some crappy blurry photo posted anyway somebody's probably good enough at identifying um, and they will ID it for you but plants spend the time so here we have, you know, our spruce tree, it's standing in place, it's not moving anywhere, you have the time to get a big picture of it from a distance so people can see the actual structure of the plant. Um, then you get a close up, you know, what did those leaves look like? How did they emerge from the stem? Um, if you start becoming a plant person, you know that, you know, if the leaves are uh, moving from either side, like alternate or opposite, though it's really important, the shape of the leaves, even the colors on the underside of the leaves, really, really critical. On trees, the kind of bark, so things like aspen and birch have very, are very easy to confuse, um, but if you get pictures of the bark, um, it's a lot easier for people to say, oh, this is definitely an aspen or this is definitely a birch based on that kind of bark. So trees, Bark, tree, bark on trees is important. And then things like if they've got seed pods showing or flowers showing, or in this case, a cone, um, those types of structures, if you've got them present, take pictures of them. You can take them from multiple angles. And as bonus points, if you carry around a tiny ruler, um, you can also do scale. And that, or if you have a coin, something like that, scale is usually pretty important. Sometimes I just put my hand down, but it's it's best if you if during this challenge, just keep a tiny little ruler in your uh, your bag. And <laughs> if you can get pictures with scale, people will love you for that. So that's something to to consider. And again, uh, if you've got lots of things in a picture, make sure you are clearly identifying what you want. So sometimes you can add in notes. I'm looking at the top thing on the picture or the, the bright green, you know, in this case, we're looking at uh, a wolf lichen, but you know, you circle it or you, you know, you point at the individual that you're, you're trying to observe so people clearly understand. Um, you don't have to like Photoshop any, out anybody else. You just have to really kind of identify what what people are looking at. And you can use words or you can use like a draw function on your phone. So how do you participate? Um, hopefully everybody's visited iNaturalist and made an account. It's pretty easy to do. The second thing is using your smartphone to download an app. And then we're gonna go start observing. So go out and take those pictures. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to use the view suggestions and then talking about going down to the lowest level um, and what that kind of means. So we're gonna do sort of a live demo. Um, this is the iNaturalist app. So this is what mine looks like when I open it up. And these are all my observations. So these are all the ones I've made. So I've made a thousand observations, which is like 
what Matt does in the weekend. Um, I have 432 species, and I have actually also contributed. Um, I've identified 1,460 other people's um, observations. So that's something to, to consider. So it's pretty easy to uh, upload things uh, on, this is using Android, but uh, Mac is fairly, or the iPhones are similar. Um, click the plus button. And now I have a choice of what I want. Do I have nothing? I didn't take a picture, it went too fast, but I can describe what I saw. Uh, those are usually like the lowest quality and people, um, people generally tend to not ID those as readily. So really, if you can get a snap a picture, even the sound, that's best. If it's right in front of me, I can take a picture or I can choose an image. I can record a sound at that moment or I can choose a sound. And you can, so it means that you can either do it live when you're right there or you can do it uh, later on if you've taken a bunch of pictures on a walk or taken a bunch of sounds on a walk. So you can do it. And sometimes I just, you know, put on a TV program and then I just like put in my eye naturalist observations. I know it's a little bit faster on the computer, but sometimes I just like using my phone. So here I'm going to choose an image. And as you can see, I take a lot of nature pictures. Um, and I'm going to go scrolling down. To, um, we're going to do this one because this is a sorry, this is a good one. Um, so this, what you can do, you can keep adding pictures. So if there was more pictures, so I had more pictures there. Um, so I can take some more pictures. And um, you know, here's another one of it singing. So I can just hold, press and hold, and it will actually select more. So now I've got three pictures of this bird. So again, you don't necessarily have to have multiple pictures, especially if one is very clear, but with plants and other small like lichens or mushrooms, make sure you get as many pictures as possible because you have up to, I think, 10 different pictures you can take. Use all that space. Now, I know what this is, so I could just type it in, but we can use the view suggestions. And so it's going to use its AI. And so you can see this, if I, if you're not sure if, if it's any one of these below here, you can just choose this, this upper one like that. And so it's going to choose that's the one that is the sort of a top level. But as I said, try and get as down, down as far as you can. So say you only knew it was a bird, you can just even type in bird, but uh, you can see that. But you can hear if you ever, if you ever click that, you can also look at this view children and it will actually give you the children of that. And so in this case, I'm gonna choose the European starling and that's what I'm going to select because that's what I know. If there were notes, like if it was singing, if it was uh, looking for a mate, if it was feeding young, you can put all that kind of stuff in. You can also, now I'm gonna choose the location and much like what Matt did on the, um, on the computer, I can type in here. And this was at Pierce Estates. Yeah, so Pierce Estates Park. And here, and now you can, if you, sometimes I find it helpful to put on this uh, satellite view. Oops, sorry, the satellite view. Um, because you can kind of sometimes see the the pictures, but if you're if you're good with just that, you can. But I like to use the satellite pictures, and that's the bottom right hand. You can see it changes from like a, a mountain to uh, <clears throat> something with a sun in a mountain. And we found it actually along right about here. So I'm just gonna press check mark. And now the visibility is open. Starlings are everywhere. I don't really care, but if I wanted to, as I, Matt said, obscure it, I can obscure it here, but I'm just gonna leave it open. Now say this was something in my garden uh, that I had planted there. I can put captured or cultivated or captive or cultivated because then it, um, iNaturalist knows that it wasn't naturally growing there. It wasn't a, a, but it wasn't like a volunteer. It didn't just kind of appear, but if it's in a park and it sort of volunteered itself, um, that would be not a captured or cultivated, even though it was something that was introduced. And then you can also add to projects. So, so you can join different projects and so you can add there, but you don't need to do that um, when you're just beginning. And then you just press check mark. 
and then it uploads. And it's as simple as that. If you're out in the field, you can, um, it will take your location exactly where you are at that moment. Um, but it can be a little bit slow. So sometimes it's nice to do this stuff at home. And it can be if your data plans are like iffy, I have a billion gigabytes or whatever. So I don't really mind doing it in the field. And some, and if you're just doing five or 10 observations when you're out on a walk, then doing it in the field is not so bad. Um, but if you, if you're like Matt and you take photos of every plant and animal you see along your walk, um, you're going to probably want to use his method rather than this. But uh, this is a great way to start, especially if you see something really unusual or different, um, getting an observation of it. Um, and especially if you want to know what it is, this is a great way of doing that. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about giving back and that's when you go to this explore section here and you can see everybody's observations and you can, so you can see, I just uploaded that right now. So that mine is the first one, but you know, people have been putting stuff in. Um, and as you can tell, there's a, here's a Franklin gull. Nobody is a, a sort of agreed with this, this observation yet. So you can click on it and then you click on these two speech bubbles. And if you agree that this is the Franklin Gull, you can click the agree with button. And now you've helped the community. So you have made the community better by agreeing with this and making it more research grade. Now, if you didn't know, don't click that button. Don't just agree because somebody else has said it, but I know that this bird is a Franklin Gull. So that's why I do that. So I usually tend to stay away from things like beetles or, or fungus. I, I tend to stick to my, my my plants and animals that I know. Um, so that's uh, that's sort of where, where you go. Now, something like a northern flicker is interested because you can actually in here, um, like what uh, Matt has done, is you can actually go down further. And he, he said it's a yellow shafted and red shafted. And I totally agree with Matt. And so now I'm going to agree with that. And that actually makes this observation better because it's a better uh, understanding of what this bird is in Alberta or Calgary especially has this type of thing. So you can, if you see somebody who's put something like just uh, a general observation and you can make it more specific, do that. And that uh, that's very, very helpful. Um, you can filter uh, as well. So if you just want to filter because people want needs ID and you're really good at birds. So those are the two things you check. Now it will just come up with just birds that need uh, IDs. And so that way you can just go through that instead of IDing things that other people have already made research grade. So th that's another way of making um, things good. So th those are just the basics. I don't want to go into too much detail. This is enough to get you started. As you learn more, you're going to, you can get better at this, but it's, it really, iNaturalist tries to make it as easy as possible. So I'm going to stop share there. And if anybody has any questions, I will, I can answer them, but um, otherwise I'm going to share my screen again. So where should you start? Um, you can start in your backyard. It's a good place to go. There's lots of things that are growing in there that are wild. Um, so you can make uh, observations there or in your neighborhood, great places to go um, or come along to one of our events. Um, we've got a fish expert who's going to be doing, um, he's actually setting traps in Bridalwood ponds. So we're actually going to be looking at fish, which I think is super exciting because it's not something I get to see every day. Um, so that's in Bridalwood, I think on Saturday. Um, I know Weaselhead is doing something on mosses and fungi. And so that's always exciting because again, it's not one of those subjects I know. And then I know that John is leading a couple of plant walks. And so that's also good. Then there's also just uh, a lot of just general nature walks. So pick one that you really like. There's some on pollinators, as I, uh, Matt said earlier as well. So pick one that you like and come along. Uh, and then resources. So if you need to know more, um, iNaturalist has a, a guide on getting started and they have tiny videos basically going over what we have. And then there's an in-person kickoff at Molly's Market with Weasel Head. So if you have if you actually want to practice with somebody there with you, um, that's a good place. But on all of the guided walks that we're doing, um, somebody will be there to help you uh, add in uh, iNaturalist observations. And I think that's it. 
So again, give back whenever you can. It's easy to do, as I said, um, and it, that makes iNaturalist better for everybody. And finally, I think that's it. Um, don't forget, Nature Calgary does have over 150 events every year. And on any one of those events, you can use iNaturalist to help us uh, know a little bit more about our city. Um, you can also check out naturecalgary.com for all of the events that we have going on for Nature Calgary. And then check out City Nature or YYC um, to see all of the events for the City Nature Challenge. All right, I see a question there on SEEK. Um, SEEK is usually, uh, we use it when um, for, for younger children who just sort of want to get into it. And that it is a great place to start if you really um, just want to know what plant names or animal names or things like that are. So that is a place to start. But um, iNaturalist is not that much harder to use. In fact, it's for an adult, I think it's just, just as easy. And, uh, and so you'll actually get you'll be contributing more um, if you use uh, iNaturalist. And as you saw on the phone, it's a pretty easy thing to use. So there's not a lot, um, I guess, more uh, to, to know about iNaturalist than seek as an adult. And also, if you're a kid, then seek is great for you. Yeah. You know, you can protect their personal privacy being young kids and just get them interested in the outdoors. So. Um, you can upload your observations directly from Seek, but if you just want to get some kids outside, then Seek is probably just for you. Yeah, I'm glad to have everybody coming tonight. Thank you so much for participating, and we hope to see you at one of our events. Um, as Matt showed, there's quite a few going on, so there's lots of opportunity for you to get out there with a group and have somebody help you upload things or identify things for you. I uh, just say that yeah, on the City Nature YYC page, we also have some additional resources, some insider hacks, you could say, if you want to make a lot of posts or you're looking for scavenger hunts, that kind of thing. And yeah, with all these different types of events, I would say there's no excuse not to get outside April 28th to May 1st. So yeah. And as Matt said earlier, we're trying to get to 10,000 observations. So if everybody just made 10 to 20 observations a day, um, we would have almost half of that um, for our challenge. So yeah, doesn't take much. Well, thanks everybody. And we'll see you at one of our events.